And the last item is one of the more practical applications of lucid dreaming is for the resolution of nightmares. And that actually is going to be my next bullet point. Am I doing the opposite chart? Mass consciousness tells us that we should fear and avoid nightmares. We get some of this from the Freudian worldview, which is that the unconscious contains some of the more unsavory elements of our psyche, and that we may not want to interact with these unsavory elements. It's better to sort of lock that basement door. And we get this from some of our movies, which make us fear the unconscious and encountering with the unconscious. So if we were to take the approach of doing the opposite, we would embrace nightmares. We would embrace the idea of doing so-called shadow work. We would want to interact with those aspects of ourselves that we ordinarily repress, that we ordinarily deny. So we'll go into some examples of that. I briefly introduced you earlier to Charlie Morley, and I want to just bring up his quote again. He says that normally when we meet our dream shadow, we run from it, we fight it, or we wake ourselves up from it. Charlie, one of the best things about his approach to teaching dreams is he's very self-deprecating. And he tells a story in his book how he's been trained He's been training as a Buddhist for a long time, since he was in his teenage years. And in his early 20s, he was learning how to meditate in the dream state. So he'd become aware during the dream, and then he would meditate. And then sometimes a shadow figure would approach him and interrupt his meditation. So he says at that point in his life, he would turn himself into a giant, and he would chop the shadow figure into pieces. <laughs> and... At the time, he thought he was being a good Buddhist because he could then return to his meditation. So he told his meditation teacher about this habit he had formed of chopping up his shadow figures as they interrupted his meditations in the dream. And his, his, his meditation teacher, of course, was alarmed and said, no, 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 you don't understand. You need to embrace your shadow. So the next time he encountered a shadow figure in his dream, he actually hugged the shadow figure, and when he reported that back to his teacher, the, te the teacher said, I didn't mean for you to literally embrace your shadow, I meant, I meant you need to dialogue with your shadow figure, you need to find out what they represent, you need to uh, engage with the shadow figure. So, um, he's an entertaining guy to, to read and, and listen to, he's got some great videos out there as well. So if we ordinarily run from our shadow figure, fight our shadow figure, and wake ourselves up from it, we need to think about what else we could do. And I have to make a confession, which is that my favorite way to deal with dream figures when I don't have awareness is to drop kick them. I have, um, I'd have never done a drop kick in waking life, but I will get a running start, I'll throw both legs up in the air, and I will take out the shadow figure. That is my go-to method when I'm not lucid and I'm not aware, when I have that immediate emotional reaction to something that startles me or frightens me or that I don't want to have in my dream. Um, that's Jumping Joe Savoldi. He was a Notre Dame football player who got into professional wrestling and patented the drop kick. So let's talk about some other approaches. So we're not attacking our dream figures, we're not running away from them, and we're not just deciding to wake ourselves up from our dream. Stephen LeBurge, in addition to being a leading lucid dream scientific researcher, he's also a prolific lucid dreamer. Matter of fact, in his studies that he did in the 1970s, he was both the scientist and the person falling asleep having the dreams. And so he's probably had more lucid dreams than anyone else around. And when uh, we, we went to his workshop, he told us the story about a very important dream he had having to do with shadow work. He is climbing down the outside of a building, sort of like have a, as I have pictured here. He said it was sort of like being like Spider-Man because he was escaping from some forgotten danger. He didn't even know what he was running from. 
but he was going to get away from it. And he sort of realizes the ridiculousness of the situation that he's climbing down the side of a building. And he, decide, he become, and that causes him to become, he says, oh, wait a minute, this is a dream. And so I, can, I don't need to worry about climbing down this building, I can just fly. And he happily flies away from the scene. But just like Robert Wagner told us earlier that the dreamer is like the sailor, the sailor does not control the, the, the sea, this is a good example of how the dreamer does not control the dream. Because initially he starts flying, but then nothing to do with his control, the scene changes, and he's in a classroom. And he's listening to an eminent Sufi teacher. Uh, it was a teacher that he respected, Indrez Shah, and who represented, certainly here in this dream, it's an inner guide coming forth. And the teacher says to the class, well, it was good that Stephen realized that he was dreaming and he could fly, but too bad. He didn't see that because it was only a dream, there was no need to escape, and there was no need to flee. And LeBert sort of almost felt embarrassed by the dream lecture. And it became sort of a turning point in his experience with lucid dreaming because he resolved after that dream that he was never going to use his lucidity to avoid a situation. That that wasn't what his inner calling was pushing him toward. So lots of people have been influenced by LeBerge. LeBerge has taught a lot of techniques about lucid dreaming. I'm not really going to spend the lecture time talking about lucid dream techniques in the question and answer period. If we want to get into that, that's something we can do. But briefly, one of the techniques that LeBerge teaches is basically a visualization technique. So if you have a recurring nightmare, you can, before you go back to sleep, you can visualize yourself back in that nightmare. And if you normally in the nightmare would attack the dream figure or run away from the dream figure or wake yourself up, wake yourself up from the dream, you can in your visualization rehearse doing something else, like engaging the dream figure in conversation. So a lot of people go to Stephen's workshops, and one of the guys that went to one of his workshops was an author out of Philadelphia named Steve Volk, who wrote an interesting book called Fringology. And Steve was interested in studying some of these areas that at least are perceived as on the bubble between respectable science and pseudoscience. And he thought lucid dreaming might be one of those areas that's sort of on the bubble. And he was also had a history of having a recurring nightmare, and he figured, well, what better way I could kill two birds. I could study this area for my book, and I might be able to do some work with my recurring nightmare. And so he tells us that he's had a he had, was experiencing a recurring nightmare that happened to him about six times per year for 20 years. And in this dream, he encountered a, a shadow figure that he would just simply call as like the boogeyman. And the boogeyman would show up, he'd be at his apartment, and the boogeyman would appear in the window with a very menacing face. And then the face would shift to one of the other windows, and then to a third window. And he could feel the fear bubbling up within him. And then the shadow figure would come around to the front door and open the door. And then he would do one of the things that Charlie Morley tells us we want to try to get away from. He would always engage the shadow figure in a fight. And they would start rolling around on the floor together uh, uh, punching each other, rolling around, wrestling each other, and then he would eventually wake up from the dream. So he used LeBerge's visualization method, and before he would go to sleep, he would visualize himself back in this dream. He'd see the guy's face showing up in the window, and he would practice seeing if he could have some sort of diff different reaction. Initially, he thought, well, maybe I'll end up having a conversation with this guy. But then he was somewhat startled that this actually worked, and he found himself back in this nightmare, but this time he was aware that he was dreaming, and he was aware that no harm could come to him. He saw the dream figure appear in the windows as usual, and then the boogeyman shows up at the door, and he kept repeating to himself, this is just a dream, no harm can come to me. And the boogeyman wanted to take things a little bit deeper, so 
when he didn't react to start wrestling with him, the boogeyman took out a gun and pointed it directly at Steve in the dream. And Steve repeated to himself, this is just a dream. No harm can come to me in this dream. That didn't stop the boogeyman from firing the gun right at his chest. And he looked down at his chest and he saw the bullets sort of just passing through him like his body was a cloud. He didn't feel any pain or anything like that. He was somewhat amazed. He sort of felt like Superman, felt like he was invincible. And he looked back at the boogeyman figure and the boogeyman figure just smiled and then walked away. So this is an interesting dream because he didn't do anything other than passively really experience the dream. And so lucid awareness does not mean trying to control the dream. It just means experiencing the dream with a higher degree of awareness so that you don't do the things that Charlie talks about. You don't run away, you don't attack, and you don't wake yourself up. And the, the result of this experience for Steve was that he never ever experienced that nightmare again. At least at the time of the writing of his book, he'd gone several years and the dream had stopped happening to him. And this is something that's commonly reported with people that use lucid dreaming for working with nightmares. Another example of this is Paul Tholey. Paul is a German lucid dream researcher and he was, um, he's been doing lucid dream work you're going back to the 60s and 70s. He had a recurring nightmare where he was being chased by a tiger. And he had learned lucid dreaming. And so he, he finally got into a, a situation where he was trying to think, if I get back in that lucid dream where the tiger's chasing me, I'm, I'm going to realize that it's just a dream. I don't need to keep running away from the tiger. So this happens in one of his dreams. He says, I pulled myself together. I stood my ground and I asked the tiger, who are you? So he asks an open-ended question. In a sense, he's following Robert Wagner's advice because he's not trying to control the dream. He leaves the pipeline open for information to flow through by asking an open-ended question. Who are you? The tiger was taken aback by my question, but then transformed into my father. And he answered, I am your father and I will now tell you what to do. And as you may surmise, he had somewhat rocky relationship with his father. And it was one where his father was always telling him what to do and disapproving of his son. As a matter of fact, he confesses that even when in other dreams where he became lucid and he encountered his father, he would normally use his lucidity to attack his father. Because that was something he wanted to do. He was, had so much anger and unresolved, so many unresolved issues with his father. But in this case, in contrast to my earlier dreams, I did not attempt to beat him. <laughs> but I attempted to get into dialogue with him. And he has a constructive dialogue with his father. It's not as if he accepted all of his father's criticisms, but he does have a constructive dialogue with him. And at the end of the conversation, my father seemed to slip into my own body, and I remained alone in the dream. And after this experience, he says his father never again appeared in his dreams as a threatening dream figure. So similar to Steve Volk, the recurring nightmare comes to an end through the application of lucid awareness. And I have one last example of this practice, which comes from our friend Robert Wagner. Before Robert wrote his book on lucid dreaming, it was an idea that he had bouncing around, but um, he decided it was just too much work. It was too much of a project. He wasn't really sure if there's really an audience interested in lucid dreaming to justify all the time and effort until he had this dream where he encounters a woman that's behind him. And I say he encounters the woman that's behind him because this woman behind him is pulsating with energy. And he had learned at that point with his lucid dreaming practice that often where the energy is in the dream, 
That's often where you want to go. You want to find out what that energy is about. So he senses this strong pulsating energy behind him in the form of a, a young woman. And he turns around. He's so interested in finding out what she's about, he actually picks her up and puts her in front of him, like on a table. And he asks her, importantly, an open-ended question. Who are you? Who are you? And the woman unexpectedly responds, I am a discarded aspect of yourself. And he didn't initially know what she was referring to, but he did immediately sense that there was truth in her statement, and he felt the need to reintegrate this woman into his being. So as he stood in front of her with accepting energy, she seemed to evaporate into me as a brief wisp of energy that just sort of got sucked into him. And that's very similar to what Paul Foley described with his father, how the energy that he had been denying or repressing, he now engaged with, and then at the end of the dream, he seems to receive the energy, sort of merges with the energy. And after this lucid dream, when he was back in the wake state, he could suddenly feel new ideas and positive emotions about writing that lucid dreaming book. All the doubts that he had surrounding his goal of writing the book had seemingly crumbled. He went to work very actively after this dream in working on the book. So she represented, I think, an inner aspect of him that was the writer, that was the, similar to my sort of Sammy Hagar figure, right? It was that part of him that was seeking to express what he was passionate about, that he had been denying, that he had not been allowing into his life. And so this lucid dream created the opening for him to stop denying the energy and allow it to flow more into his life.